Hello, dear listeners. My name is Rose Goldfop, and I am the creator of this audio drama. I would like to welcome you to our second season of the Wessex Dramas with an adaptation of Thomas Hardy's romantic comedy, The Hand of Ethelberta. As with all romantic comedies, her hand is in hot demand, and her choice of who to give it to is also in hot debate. So, loosen up your corsets, cosy up to the fire, and let us catch up with the drama. Mrs. Ethelberta Petherwin a beautiful, self-possessed and richly dressed young woman of around 21 years old, exits the front door and saunters out for a late afternoon walk, carrying her parasol. Two men are watching her as she walks past them and down the road. One man sweeping the straw away is a middle-aged hostler, and the other is Michael, an elderly milkman in his shirt sleeves, waistcoat and long white apron. Michael is carrying two milk buckets on a yoke, which he puts down. <gasps> Dang me if she bain't be a pretty piece. The hostler looks faux shocked at the milkman. Michael, pouncing upon young flesh like a carrion crow be a vile thing in an old man. The young woman, Ethelberta, has stopped to peer into a shop window. That figure of fashion a standing there be a widow, though she be no more than twenty one years, I'll be. He stops sweeping and leans on his broom to gaze also at the young woman. Well then, her can easily wed another with her looks. Aye. But her mother-in-law, Lady Petherwin, might have some say in that. What's the widow's own family? Dang me if I know. But it's a funny thing, see, cos the other night she said, Good evening, John, as she walked past me. Michael looks at the hostler in disbelief, picks up his pails and nods a farewell to the hostler. Well, more no Tom Fool than Tom Fool knows. Michael walks off. The hostler stands and looks mystified. He repeats the saying to himself. More no Tom Fool than Tom Fool knows. <laughs> he goes back to his sweeping, shaking his head. That's a good one. <laughs> Tom Fool. Tom Fool knows. Mrs. Pethewin walks gracefully on down the lane with her jewelled silks glowing in the afternoon sun. Ethelberta wanders in her walk across some meadows near a river and then follows a lane that leads out onto an open heath. It is that early dusk when, in summer, the air is golden and still. Suddenly, a duck flies past very quickly and quite low, chased by a hawk. Ethelberta stares fascinatedly as the duck flies down into the gentle valley below, heading towards a whitely shining oval of still water. Ethelberta starts off after them at a run. The duck hits the pond and dives under, and, as Ethelberta runs up, after making one or two desultory circuits in the air around the pond, the hawk flies away. Ethelberta sees the poor duck over the far side of the pond. She walks over towards it, but it flees into some reeds. Ethelberta looks around at the beautiful scene, sighs at the beauty, and then sets off, back up a small valley. She walks for a while and then stops, looks round, and perceives that she has gone the wrong way. The twilight is deepening now, although there is still enough light to see. Ethelberta comes round a corner and almost bumps into a handsome young man, Christopher, in his mid-twenties, in holiday walking clothes and gaiters, with an open net shirt. She starts by oh. not seeing his face properly due to his hat brim. Good evening. Um, could you tell me the way to the Red Lion, please? Yes, it's just up that small valley, and then turn left at the top ah. and follow the path. Mr. Julian! Mrs. Petherwin, um, yes, I am Mr. Julian. Although I suppose that matters very little after all these years, and after, you know, um, what's past. Ethelberta looks a little embarrassed as well, and looks downwards. Shall I put you in the path? It's just up there. If you please. He sets off up the little valley. They walk in silence, with Christopher leading. Christopher points down the hill and then stares fixedly at her. Ethelberta's face is turned a little away. That's Anglebury. This path goes around that hill, there, and then you'll see the town. She looks up to see him staring at her. He embarrassedly looks away. Thank you. <sighs> good evening, then. He turns a little away. Well, goodbye, then, if... if you're not going to say any more. What can I say? You aren't mine now. I could forgive a woman doing anything to me, except perhaps for, well, for marrying for spite. Or, or was it the money, perhaps? Christopher, you knew me only as a governess. You knew little else of me, my background, 
and my motives, so you have no excuse for bitterness. Well, perhaps I'm bitter, but you are certainly married, so there's no way now that I'm going to discover your background anyway. Although, I do think that I know a lady on hard times when I see one. I suppose, on reflection, though, that I can hardly blame a woman born into a wealthy home from attempting to regain that position. He gives a short <laughs> laugh. Ethelbert gives a strange smile. Christopher holds out his hand. Could we... um... could we... uh... perhaps part friends? I... I hope that we may meet again someday. They shake briefly. Good evening, Mrs. Petherwin. Good evening, Mr. Julian. He walks off, and Ethelberta, after looking wistfully after him for a second, sighs and walks off in the direction of Anglebury. As Ethelberta enters the hallway of the inn, she passes her lady's maid, Menlove, in an old black silk gown, who has come out of one door and is just about to go into the kitchen area. Ethelberta nods. Good evening, Menlove. Oh! Menlove stops. Good evening, ma'am. Menlove? Did you see if any gentlemen observed and followed me when I went for my walk this afternoon? You once told me that I was not to go staring out the window at you after I had dressed you, as if you were a doll I had just made and sent out for sale. Oh, um, yes. Then did you hear any gentlemen arrive here by train last night? Then love looks pertly surprised. Oh, no, ma'am. How could I? I was rinsing the smalls. A smart elderly lady passes and looks with shocked disgust at this public reference to smalls. Ethelberta acts quickly. Yes, yes. One has to rinse the smells back down the drains. The departing lady looks back suspiciously at them as she goes up the open staircase. Menlove smiles, nods and vanishes through the services door and Ethelberta looks askance at her. Lady Pethewin is sitting writing at a desk as Ethelberta hurries in. Lady Pethewin looks up. Hello, Mama. Sorry I'm late. Ethelberta goes over and kisses Lady Pethewin on the cheek. Where on earth have you been, child? You look quite heated. Oh, I saw a hawk chase a duck and followed it. And then I became rather lost under heat. Lady Pethewin lifts up her hands in horror. Mercy, child. What a tomboy you are. You might have been drowned in that swampy place. Ethelberta is taking off her scarf, hat and jacket, which she puts on a sofa. Oh, a man told me the way, so I was all right in the end. She sits down and Lady Pethewin sighs and frowns disapprovingly and starts to write again. Ethelberta picks up some embroidery and sews. Mother, you know when you sent me to that finishing school in Bonn, after my husband's death? Hmm? Well, then you wrote to me to say that some family we knew had their household broken up after the father's death. Do you mean the Julians? Oh, was that the name? Yes, of course, you know. Their boy, Christopher, had a day or two's fancy for you, just before that summer, when my poor boy and you became so desperately attached to each other. Oh, yes. I remember his sister Faith now. His mother died soon after in childbirth. It was her thirteenth child, I think. Poor woman. I wonder where they live now. I have a dim notion that the son, who had not been brought up to a profession, moved to a country town somewhere, and now works as a music teacher, piano and that sort of thing. Music was his hobby, you remember. Oh, um... She resumes her writing, and Ethelberta gazes at the fire. Ring for Coco, dear. Ethelberta looks up. Yes, Mama. Ethelberta enters her room and rings the bell cord. She walks up and down in thought until her lady's maid, Menlove, enters. Menlove, will you go down and find out if any gentleman named Mr Julian has been staying in this inn, please? And find out his address, will you? Yes, ma'am. I'll just tell the landlady you're interested, what? then. No. No, don't mention anything. Um, um, directly as such, Manlove. Just, just make enquiries. Um, uh, indirectly. Ah, yes. I'll be sure to tell her as I'm not asking for you, but for someone else. Ethelberta collapses irritably into a chair. Ah, 
Nella, I'm sure you know what I mean. Don't go to the landlady at all. Just ask one of the, the underservants, you know. And don't mention you, ma'am. Yes, I mean, no. Oh. Then Love nods, smiles and whisks out. Ethelberta gets up and paces the room a while, and then Menlove reappears. She hands Ethelberta a slip of paper. Ma'am. She nods, raises her eyebrows implyingly with a smirk, and Ethelberta glares at the eyebrows. Whereupon, Menlove looks saucer idly ingenuous, puts her head down and whisks out again. Christopher comes into the room holding a package which he cuts the string from whilst removing his jacket and hat. He sits down at the table in the small homely room and removes the green book from its brown paper. He reads the frontispiece, metres by E, and looks puzzled. He quickly reads the poems in the collection and then looks excited. Christopher looks up and calls for his sister. Faith? Faith comes through from the neighbouring room. She is affectionate but homely in looks and around twenty-two. Hello, Christopher. Have a look at these. She bends and kisses his cheek. What are they? Poems. And I'm pretty sure that they're from the woman that I was keen on a few years ago. You remember, she married the son of Lord Petherwin. Faith bends over and starts rifling through the papers. Oh, yes. Well, having cast you aside, all I can say is that it's a bit thick of her to then send you her poems. Anyway, how do you know they're hers? Faith reads the final poem, cancelled words. Well, first, she's called Ethelberta, as in E. Secondly, she was a seriously aspiring dramatist slash poetess. And thirdly, well, I bumped into her again last summer in Anglebury on that short walking holiday I took, remember? Um, this last one is a very touching poem. Perhaps she still has tender feelings for you. What? While being married? I rather like that last poem, though. So do I. She smiles up at him. Tea? Christopher is standing at the counter of a small old bookshop, talking to a little elderly shopkeeper who is wearing a big blue apron and has his glasses on top of his head. No copy of the book has been sold by me. But its packaging tells me that it's been delivered locally. He only looks details up in a big book, running his finger down the lines of information. The book was only published last week. He looks up. Mind you, if it had been published last century, I probably wouldn't have sold it. Country book selling is a, a miserable thing these days. Christopher looks around at the small half-stocked shop. Surely you don't live by your shop. The old man leans over the counter and puts his hand flat on Christopher's lapel. Sir, I starve by it. Christopher smiles and nods sympathetically. Christopher comes into the post office on his way to teaching his lessons. There is a young male clerk putting posts into pigeonholes behind the counter. The plump, middle-aged postmaster at the counter looks up at Christopher, who is waving a torn package at him. Sorry to bother you, but could I ask whose handwriting this is, please? It was sent anonymously to me, and I want to thank the giver. Christopher smooths out the packaging on the counter, and the postmaster and his clerk peer at it. No, never seen this hand before. Sorry. Oh, I have. She comes into town every day. Oh, a lady. Um, what does she wear? A uh, white wool jacket with zigzag of black braid. I don't know her name, though. Christopher smiles. Thanks. Thank you. He turns away. Do you want to settle that bill for the special delivery? Well, I'm late for the lessons I'm supposed to be giving, so if you'll forgive me, I'll pop in again later this week. Thank you. He goes out. Christopher is returning home at the end of the day. His collar is unbuttoned and his neckerchief hangs loose around his neck. A pretty young woman, Piketty, comes towards him from the Sanborn direction. She is wearing a white jacket with black zigzags. Christopher smiles and nods, and the girl does too. Each goes on their ways. Christopher looks back and smiles with puzzlement. The girl is not Ethelberta. The same girl, wearing another jacket, comes towards Christopher, who is just getting out a book from his left pocket. Christopher smiles, stops, and raises his hat. The girl, Piketty, seventeen and diminutive, with a fresh, rosy complexion, stops, smiles briefly, then looks down. Excuse me, but do I have the pleasure of addressing the author of a book of very melodious poems sent to me the other day? Piketty rapidly twirls a bit of braid on her costume. 
and looks embarrassed. No, sir. The sender, then, perhaps? Yes, sir. Christopher smiles and nods. Ah, yes. Such an atmosphere as the writer of Meters by E seems to breathe would soon spoil cheeks that are fresh and round as Lady Apple's. Eh, little girl? But are you disposed to tell me the writer's name, perhaps? Kitty draws herself up, offended by his light tone, and the reference to her plump cheek, which she touches tentatively in confirmation. She responds in high dudgeon, with her chin raised. No, I am not disposed to tell the writer's name. She steps around him and walks away, while he turns around and, in surprise, watches her leave. There's a montage of accidental meetings along the wide meadow footpath. Christopher sees Piketty and raises his hat. Piketty nods coolly and walks on. Christopher is reading a book and doesn't see her. Piketty has a quick look at him and looks away embarrassedly. Christopher standing and looking into the river while Piketty passes, blushing, unobserved. Christopher is walking while reading and Piketty is breathing fast and looks discomposed. He doesn't know where to look as they pass at around four metres distant. He doesn't see her though. Christopher isn't reading, so he sees Piketty, but as he approaches, she is so overcome with embarrassment that she has to turn around and stand with her back to him so that he doesn't witness her discomposure. Christopher is a little puzzled, but walks on. Christopher comes out of a door, followed by a middle-aged woman, mother, and her late teenaged daughter, Celia. The ladies remain standing on the threshold as Christopher shakes their hands and takes a step down to descend the front steps. The girl offers a small posy to Christopher to thank him. Well, thank you for Celia's lessons, Mr Grey. We're sure she'll do well in her auditions for music college, with all of the work you put in. Yes, thank you. Christopher takes the flowers and smiles. You're very welcome. You have been a pleasure to teach, Miss Jones. He bows. Thank you, ladies. Good afternoon. Goodbye. Goodbye. He walks away. Goodbye. Christopher turns and waves. Christopher crosses the road, turns into the field, and walks along the footpath home. Christopher looks up to see Piketty, who, when she sees him, becomes rigid with embarrassment, which Christopher doesn't notice. He bows to her and holds out the posy. Will you allow me to present these flowers to you by way of a peace offering for... for my being so indelicate as to compliment your cheeks, um, to your face, um, as it were... So as to speak. Sort of. He smiles embarrassedly and yet again thrusts the posy further at her. Piketty takes the posy, lowers her head and mumbles something inarticulate into it. Well, good afternoon then. He nods and smiles and strides away. Piketty sniffs the posy and then furtively turns around to see him go. She sighs wistfully and looks with adoring eyes after him. Piketty sees a movement out of the corner of her eyes and turns to see the weir man attending to the handle of the sluice of the river's weir near to his house. It is pouring down and two smart young urban men are sitting immaculately attired in tweeds near a fire belonging to the weir man who is sitting a little further away. A meadow is visible through the wet window and a path goes along it to meet a crossroads. The first young man addresses the weir man. I say, it's jolly decent of you letting us invade your home fires and all. We don't want to put you out, you know. Not at all, gentlemen. You wouldn't be leaving a dog out in this weather. You, you wouldn't happen to have a little grog or such, would you? Happen I would. He gets up and fetches a half-open bottle of whiskey and some small glasses, which he deposits on the table. Oh, good oh. He then proceeds to pour and then hand out the whiskey. They see a young woman, Piketty, approach the crossroads near where she often sees Christopher. She stands there, already sodden through, looking anxiously up and down the road. The weir man nods at her through the window. Now, gentlemen, you begin the chance to see a lovelorn maid await her lover. She's been here several days this last week, but he don't come. He don't come at all. The young man drinks his whiskey. Sounds a bit of a rotter to me. Eh? Lady Will, what do you think? Ladywell turns from the window. She'd make an excellent subject for another of my academy paintings. And she'd be famous, too. For they all sell. He turns to the weir man. I say, you wouldn't have some eggs and bacon, would you? And perhaps a few mushrooms? The weir man looks put out and rolls his eyes in exasperation at the demands of the young man. 
Forget food. The rain seems to be lifting. Let's be off for Wyndham House, a change of clothes and dinner. I'll just give the poor little girl another minute, and then we don't disturb her. The young man smiles brightly and looks at the weir man. Oh, well, perhaps just time for a cup of tea now. Then, eh? The weir man sighs melodramatically and gets heavily to his feet, heading for the cups on the dresser, while giving a backwards look of disgust at the young man. composer James Cox. And of course, we would like to thank our entrancing cast. Matthew Libri, Alex Davenport, Carl Wharton, David Neville, Marion Chase, Mike Keane, James Makerpiece, Glenn Hanna, Lucy Kennedy, Stephanie Stephan, Catherine McCoolgan, Stephen Dean, Jenny Dyer, Caroline Joy, Thomas Purchase Rathbone, Jenny Bowden, Victoria Knowles, Mac McGuire, and Nathan Walker. And last but not least, thank you to you too, dear listeners, without whom this would not be possible.